Now we'd like to start a session one on the global economic outlook and acceleration of tightening monetary policy. And please understand our speakers and panelists may remove their, remove their masks during being on stage for the more accurate conversation. Thank you so much for your understanding. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our moderator for this session. Please welcome Shin Hyun Sung, uh, the economic advisor and head of research of a Bank for International Settlement. Please welcome him. Thank you very much for um, this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, it's a, it's uh, my great pleasure to moderate uh, this first session in the morning. Uh, and it's going to be um, a, a very comprehensive look at the current uh, global economic situation. Um, we have, as well as the distinguished panel with me on stage, uh, we also have two distinguished speakers that are waiting uh, online to join us um, uh, at uh, a very, um, uh, very late or very early hour of the day, depending on which way you look at it. Um, as uh, Professor Osfeld told us in the keynote address, uh, we're facing some very big challenges in the global economy right now. We have inflation running at uh, multi-decade highs, and that's been compounded uh, by the after effects of the pandemic and associated impact uh, to do with supply chains um, and the lockdowns as well. Added to that has been the war in Ukraine, which, was, which has added the strains on commodity markets, both for energy and food, which has exacerbated uh, the pressure on inflation. As Professor Osfeld told us, um, the exchange rate plays many roles, but one of the important roles is as an indicator of financial conditions. So, it's not only a measure of the trade balance, but also uh, an indicator of risk-taking and of financial conditions. And that means that we have uh, now a situation where uh, the financial conditions are now spreading globally, um, and that is setting the stage for what will prove to be a very good discussion, I feel. So let me introduce uh, the panel, and I'll do so um, as they come up uh, to speak um, so that we can, we can save time. We're actually very lucky to have uh, Ayan Koza, who was actually mentioned by Professor Osfeld in, uh, 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 in his keynote address this morning. And um, Ayan, as you know, is a very well-established and highly respected macro researcher. Um, he's the chief economist uh, at, the, at the World Bank and has led the, um, the Global Prospects Group, uh, which is one of the most important commentaries on the global economy. So what we will do is to uh, hand over to the speakers. The first three speakers will have 15 minutes, and then we have three very good discussants who will then follow with uh, 10 minutes each. And I would like to leave some time for uh, general discussions within the panel as well as some questions also from the floor. So um, let me then turn to Ihan uh, for his presentation. So Ihan, thank you for joining us um, at this very early hour. Th thank you very much. Uh, it's great to join you. Uh, it's unfortunate that I cannot join you in person despite my repeated attempts. Uh, my presentation uh, will be mostly on this new study uh, Professor Oxford mentioned earlier, he released last week about the possibility of a global recession. Um, in this context, I'm going to uh, focus on two questions. Here, if I have time, I will get to the third one. The first one is, what are near-term prospects for the global economy? And the second one, what threat does stagflation present for emerging market developing economies? Uh, the third question is, what are the policy priorities? Uh, very similar to uh, Professor Hobsfeld's messages here. Uh, throughout the presentation, I will use this acronym EMDs, 
emerging market and developed economies. Let me start with the first question, near-term prospects for the global economy. So uh, let me uh, quickly talk about the state of the global economy. We all know that uh, global activity has been slowing. Uh, commodity prices have been declining, except energy, they remain elevated. Financial conditions have been getting tighter, uh, and global trade has been decelerated. So, all in all, uh, we have a sharp global slowdown in our hands. The question then, how sharp is the slowdown when you compare with developments prior to the previous global recessions? Uh, the global economy experienced five global recessions since 1970. In each of these episodes, per capita global output contracted in 1975, 82, 91, 2009, and 2020. In this slide, uh, shaded areas in each panel show the evolution of respective variables around these global recession episodes, the earlier episodes. As you can see on the left panel, Global GDP has been slowing at a much sharper pace than that prior to previous global recessions. Uh, we are also seeing uh, much sharper declines in equity markets in comparison to the run-up of these previous episodes. You see it in the middle panel. And uh, we see a much sharper drop in consumer confidence when you compare uh, what happened prior to these previous episodes. Uh, these indicators do not augur well for the future trajectory of global activity. So let me turn to the second issue. This, uh, sorry. The, let me uh, quickly talk about the evolution of growth and inflation uh, forecasts for this year and next year. Uh, these are not World Bank forecasts. Uh, these are forecasts from consensus economics, so they timely represent views of a wide range of forecasters. As you can see here, global growth forecasts have been downgraded significantly for this year and the next year. For 2022, uh, the forecast uh, sits uh, at 2.7 percent. Uh, it was slightly above 4 percent at the beginning of the year, and that tells you how sharp the slowdown has been. For 2023, uh, the growth forecast was downgraded from 3.2% in February, 2.3% now. So the 2023 as well, we see a sharp uh, downgrade uh, month after month in forecast, and in all likelihood, this will continue in the near future. Inflation forecast for the global economy jumped from 3.6% in January to uh, more than 8% now. And for next year, they went up from 2.7% in February to 4.6% now. Uh, so the inflation forecast have been moving in the opposite directions, have been upgraded, uh, and inflation, of course, have been now running uh, globally at almost three decades high. In emerging market developing economies, uh, the inflation is at 14 years high, and in advanced economies of four decades high. So by some measure, we are already in a period of stagflation. The term of stagflation is, uh, uh, the term stagflation is poorly defined. Uh, the general consensus is that it's the state of high inflation and weak growth. And we are beginning to look uh, much closer to the stagflation of the 1970s in the shorter term, of course, than uh, what we did six months ago. If you define high inflation as inflation above targets or uh, multi-year highs, or if you define weak growth as steeply slowing growth, uh, 2022 and 23 both qualify actually as years of stagflation with these forecasts. There are multiple risks confronting the global economy, but uh, I will briefly talk about why the risk of stagflation is a major threat for emerging market developing economies. This brings me to the second question. So, uh, Professor Opsal already uh, provided a little bit of uh, context uh, about the 70s episodes and the current episode. Uh, the, uh, I would like to focus on three major similarities between the 70s and now, 
the first one, we have high global inflation, still lower than what we saw uh, the, on the average in the 70s, and a very sharp slowdown after the 2020 global recession, similar to what happened after the 1975 global recession. So for stagflation, the stage is set. When you look at global real interest rates and how accommodative monetary policies have been, 1970s and the 2010s, quite similar, at least in one important dimension, global real interest rates average minus 0.5%. And in both cases, of course, in the 70s as well as 2010s, emerging market developing economies accumulated significant amount of debt with uh, very large vulnerabilities. There are some important differences that should make us uh, hopeful. Um, first, uh, there has been a paradigm shift in monetary policy framework since the 1970s. You look around the world, uh, central banks have uh, inflation targeting frameworks, they have periodic meet meetings, they are much more transparent. So uh, there is a well-defined anchor in many of these uh, central banks in advanced economies, emerging market developing economies. So that's good news to keep inflation expectations under control as much as possible. Wage growth in the United States has been quite uh, sharp, but still lower than what we saw in the second half of the 70s. And uh, another important factor is that we have much more flexible economies if you look at labor markets, and of course, uh, much less dependent on energy when you look at energy use in terms of producing output. So there are some good reasons to worry and some good reasons to think that we can overcome this episode. Fast forward today uh, to stem risks from persistent high inflation uh, in a context of limited fiscal space, many countries are withdrawing monetary and fiscal support um, that was provided during the pandemic. As a result, uh, we think that global economy is in the midst of one of the most internationally synchronous episodes of monetary and fiscal policy tightening of the past five decades. You can look at monetary policy, we saw on the left, uh, the number of policy interest rate increases uh, reached an all-time high this year, last July. You can look at fiscal policy on the right, uh, share of countries with tightening fiscal stance uh, is expected to be at the highest uh, level uh, as, uh, at least uh, since the early 1990s. So, um, a globally synchronized tightening of policies will likely help reduce inflation. Uh, however, because these are highly synchronous, they could be mutually compounding in their effects, tightening financial conditions and steepening the global growth slowdown more than envisioned. Uh, of course, this prospect of compounding suggests that, as uh, Professor Ofsfeld uh, repeatedly emphasized, national policymakers should take into account potential spillovers of the globally synchronous tightening uh, that is underway. So uh, while the global economy is experiencing the most intense tightening cycle in decades, the expected degree of global monetary policy tightening might not be sufficient to return global inflation and the core inflation to a rate compatible with central bank targets uh, within the usual time horizon over the next two years. Uh, this highlights the risk of an upward drift in inflation expectations. This risk is very clear when reviewing the actions of the US uh, Fed policy during previous tightening episodes, as you see in the slide, specifically, the market implied path of policy interest rates over 2022-23 is still much lower than the recent trend of core inflation prints in contrast to the historical experience since the late 1970s, implying that, as Professor Ofsted mentioned, a much sharper increase in interest rates might be necessary to contain inflationary pressures. So uh, how... Uh, uh, this type of tightening would affect uh, outcomes. Uh, in the latest paper, we looked at three scenarios. These are purely illustrative scenarios uh, we produced using an off-the-shelf uh, global 
uh, semi-structural macro model. Uh, here, you can see these scenarios for the interest rates and inflation. In the baseline scenario, the model behaves, but the recent consensus forecast for inflation and interest rates uh, imply. Uh, but the, uh, if that's the case, the degree of monetary policy tightening currently expected uh, may not be enough to restore low inflation. Uh, global inflation remains around 4.6% under the baseline, and the, the nominal policy rate is close to 4%. The second scenario that in place a, implies a sharp downturn uh, assumes that upward pickup in inflation expectations that basically push central bankers to tighten further by another 100 basis points relative to the current path. So the nominal uh, interest rate at the global level goes up to 5%. These additional rate hikes uh, synchronously uh, would cause the global real short-term rate uh, to rise to 0.6%. So the, the real interest rates would become positive, but still uh, inflation uh, won't come down uh, enough to make central bankers comfortable. In the third scenario, we call it global recession, uh, central banks would increase interest rates by another 100 basis points at the global level, push the global real rate roughly to 3%. That means the nominal global rate goes up to 6%. And then, of course, this will push the inflation uh, comfortably to 3%. That's the average at the global level, what we saw prior to the pandemic over the period 2015-19. But this move also triggered a sharp repricing of uh, risk in global financial markets and uh, magnifies the vulnerabilities already present. Finally, uh, what are the implications of these scenarios, the synchronous tightening of policies for growth outcomes? In the baseline scenario, global growth would be 2.4%, perfectly acceptable in 2023, but inflation uh, will not be at a level that's acceptable. In the sharp downturn scenario, global economy registered growth very low, around 1.7%, one of the lowest over the past 50 years. It escapes a recession, but inflation remains far above still the level central banks are going to be comfortable. In the global recession scenario, global growth declines to 0.5%. And in per capita terms, it means that global economy contracts by about 0.4%, and that's the technical definition of a global recession. When you have this type of recession, it takes a heavy toll in advanced economies. It pushes advanced economies into a recession as a group in 2023. For emerging market developing economies, growth would decline to 1.8%, the half of what they are expected to have this year. Of course, this type of uh, growth performance will likely coincide with financial stress episodes in these economies. How to think about a global recession in 2023? If you go back to early 1980s, advanced economies remember the Volcker recession of 1982 as the end of stagflation. But for emerging market developing economies, they remember it as the beginning of a string of financial crises a steep growth slowdown, weakened debt servicing capacity, and more than 40 debt crises erupted in these economies during the 1980s. And of course, these uh, crises uh, accompanied by a decade of lost growth. So let me summarize. The first question I asked, what are new term prospects for the global economy? Weaker growth, and in all likelihood, lower inflation, but still elevated inflation, uh, multiple risk cloud to outlook. One of these risks is the stagflation for this year and the next year. The second question was, what threat does stagflation present for emerging market developing economies? The 1970s episode ended with a global recession, accompanied with a series of financial crises in emerging market developing economies. Uh, these economies are now facing a rising risk of a similar outcome. And the third question, what are the policy priorities? It's critical to think about the implications of these globally synchronous policies and uh, to think about uh, demand man management 
uh, um, uh, interventions through monetary, fiscal, and financial policies, but also to think about supply side measures to uh, provide additional uh, supply to the markets, especially in the context of energy. Uh, let me stop there. Uh, to back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayan, for setting the stage so well for us. Um, so Ayan has given us a, a broad global picture. Uh, let's move on now to um, Hiranya uh, Mukhopadhyay from the Asian Development Bank. He's going to give us um, the picture from the perspective of, uh, of the low-income economies. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that Hiranya will not be using his, uh, his slide deck, uh, but uh, uh, you can certainly uh, reference them in the, in the uh, booklet that you have. And then after that, we will have Tobias Adrian from the IMF. Can someone put those slides in the screen? I'll, I'll not be using that. Yes. OK. I did not realize that uh, my whole presentation will be there in the conference volume. So, and since the time is very short, so let me summarize to some extent a gloomy picture uh, from our daily experience, practical experience of dealing with the developing member countries. On a daily basis, we are dealing with our ADB's member countries and we know from the war zone the problems they are facing every day. Uh, let me, uh, most of our DMCs are badly affected by the twin shocks, COVID-19 pandemic 2020 and um, Ukraine during Ukraine, Russia, uh, Ukraine war during 2022. None, not a single country has fiscal space. Not a single country, most of the countries do not have fiscal headroom to carry out uh, necessary investment for meeting SDG targets or, or providing uh, necessary support to the weaker sections without risking the debt sustainability. Almost all countries have come to ADB for emergency liquidity support immediately after pandemic. And the same country came back in 2022 again for another round of liquidity sup uh, support after the Ukraine war under ADB's counter cyclical support facility. And, and we see the problems they are facing. And in this context, let me have a word of caution, uh, very important point that uh, developing countries are yet to recover from the twin shocks, as you all know, uh, that COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and then uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2020. Don't forget, don't forget a third shock, a third crisis is slowly but steadily emerging in the horizon that we see, that we see every day when we meet our developing member countries, that is the food crisis. If we do not understand the implications of the food crisis, we will end up in a very deep crisis eventually. But we see that this third crisis is slowly but steadily emerging in the horizon. And remember that growth recovery after the pandemic, all these are interrelated. You cannot say that I will take some actions to ensure um, financial stability. I take some actions just to ensure debt sustainability. All these issues we are discussing here today on in various other forums, like for example, how to ensure um, uh, and sustain the recovery from uh, growth recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, how to ensure the countries do have sufficient fiscal space to address climate change mitigation adoption, how to ensure debt sustainability, how to ensure financial stability, all interrelated, all interrelated. And we cannot just address one issue in isolation. While listening to Professor Ofspil and listening to um, uh, Ayan, I see, I see the reflection of the arguments of Professor Opsfield in my daily experience while dealing with the policymakers. Let me give you an example. I was writing down that I see that tightening of the interest rate caused higher price of imports, as he has explained, 
Some countries can intervene, some countries cannot intervene. India could intervene to keep the exchange rate below 80 rupees per dollar, but many countries, but how long in India can intervene? Some countries cannot intervene. So naturally, in those countries, the prices of food, prices of oil, prices of energy are shorting up. So what does it happen? What, does it, what is the problem it is creating? Those countries, those countries do, do not have fiscal space or fiscal uh, headroom. They are unable to cut down the subsidies. They are unable to exit from the incentives, tax incentives that they provided during COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic. So they are in a deep trouble and they, on top of that, they need to provide additional transfer payments, additional support to the weaker and the vulnerable section of the population. So they are not in a position to take necessary actions to ensure fiscal space and create fiscal space and fiscal headroom. Given this context, let me quickly present some numbers so you will understand what I am saying. Yes, you can see that, you can see that from this that, that almost all countries, just a second, if you look at this picture and if you look at the next picture, let me summarize. Almost all countries, there will be some exceptions here and there, almost all countries in our region, Asia and Pacific region, or you can say ADB's member countries, there are serious spikes in fiscal deficit and debt to GDP ratio. Almost all countries. And as you know, this, I don't have to explain it, these are primarily explained by, uh, primarily explained by uh, that um, loss in revenue during the 19, uh, 2020 pandemic and also 2021 loss in revenue and higher expenditure. expenditure. Almost all countries provided um, counter-cyclical support facility. Almost all countries provided uh, support to the weaker and vulnerable sections. So this is because of the expenditure and higher, um, higher expenditure and lower revenue. Almost all countries have a serious spikes in fiscal deficit and debt, government debt to, uh, debt to GDP ratio you can see. And many countries, remember that some countries debt to GDP ratio improved uh, in 2021, but in many countries debt to GDP ratio continued to rise. Now, what do we do? As I said in the beginning that um, I'm, not, I'm just skipping this, my slides on GDP growth and inflation. So Ian has explained thoroughly ex inflations. We, are all, we all know these countries have started facing the serious inflation challenges, serious inflation problem, especially after the Russian war, Russian invasion of in Ukraine. So I am just skipping those slides. Now, again, let me skip this, um, uh, uh, this particular slide. We all know debt deficit dynamics, and it is very prominent in for our member countries, ADB's developing member countries, you can see. So, um, no, uh, the countries need to take immediately some steps some actions, some policy measures to reduce, cut their deficit. Though they cannot just cut their deficit, they have to either um, improve the allocative efficiency of scarce public resources or they have to get quickly over the short term some revenue. So basically we have, we, we are, of course all the, almost all countries are now currently ongoing, there are ongoing reform measures and then countries should continue to have those reform measures. but. What you are suggesting that the country should take immediately some steps to get some fiscal space. One is rationalized tax incentives. We have been saying repeatedly that, that those incentives the countries introduced during 2020 and they must have an exit policy. That ex the incentive should be timely and uh, targeted and temporary. The temporary nature of the incentives is very difficult for the countries to exit from those incentives. ADB has provided a toolkit or policy paper how the countries can exit from the, uh, these incentives and, and, and recover those foregone uh, um, uh, loss, loss, revenue losses. Secondly, the countries should immediately work on to, uh, to design VAT appropriately to, 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 to mobilize revenue from highly dig digitalized economic activities. There are many opportunities, there are many avenues the countries can tap to get more revenues from this digital trade, digitalized economy. Think seriously, think seriously about carbon pricing. 
think seriously there is enough opportunity where you can get some additional revenue from carbon taxation or uh, rationalization of fossil fuel subsidy. Even if you don't go to em emission trading, but still you can get some revenue from taxing uh, uh, carbon taxation and as well as fossil fuel uh, subsidy rationalization. And another very important initiative the country should really think seriously to get revenue immediately over the short run is asset monetization. We are working on asset monetization in many countries, in many developing member countries, and uh, India is taking it very seriously, and many other countries are taking it very seriously. There is enormous scope, enough scope for uh, mobilized revenue through asset monetization. And on the, exp but of course, as I said, there are many initiatives that are currently ongoing in many countries, but they should continue, but immediately they should look at these three or four alternatives so that they can create some fiscal space. But the story is not complete unless you work also, also work on the expenditure side. There are, there are many, many suggestions I have proposed in my presentations. Uh, in my presentation, you can look at those suggestions in the conference volume. But let me summarize quickly that uh, you have to we have, to, we have to help them. The countries need to improve this allocative efficiency of scarce public resources. The countries need to improve the infrastructure governance, which is also a priority item for G20. And then ADB is very seriously working on infrastructure governance. There are many documents, many toolkit, uh, uh, and ADB is working with IMF, ADB is working with the World Bank to promote infra good infrastructure governance. So we have to introduce good infrastructure governance. We have to introduce uh, climate concerns, climate issues uh, during um, allocations of public resources. And then, um, as I said, we have to improve. There are many other steps, uh, reforms we have uh, I highlighted in the presentations. So countries should in, in work on those initiatives to improve, primarily to improve allocative efficiency of scarce public resources. Now, the main point, let me summarize, let me summarize, the countries must work on to create the fiscal space under very, very difficult, very, very difficult circumstances. Now, as I said in the beginning, that uh, the current situations and current environment is not very conducive to take very strong actions to, um, to, to, to or rather to facilitate very st uh, strong, very um, tough money, fiscal stance current situation is not very conducive in many countries, many developing member countries. There may be some exceptions, but there is no alternative. We have to create the fiscal space. We have to ensure the countries have fiscal headroom so that they can invest uh, to meet the SDG targets, to, so they can invest on various developmental projects without risk risking the debt sustainability. And, and as I said at the beginning, the debt sustainability, exchange rate stability, financial stability, all are interrelated. And the, we have to really work at, um, with the countries, with, to help the countries to look at the macro picture and take good policy decisions to address these issues in a comprehensive manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hiranya, for giving us uh, this picture from the low-income economies. Uh, what I would like to do now is to, um, is to turn to Tobias Adrian. Before I introduce him, um, let me just say that I think for the, from the first two speakers, we have had a very good description of uh, <coughs> the challenges uh, that we're facing right now. Um, as Professor Offspelt described this morning, the strong dollar is, a, is uh, setting a particularly challenging backdrop because it gives uh, very tight financial conditions. In terms of the outcome for each economy, however, uh, of course, it's the resilience and the degree to which um, the uh, domestic policy frameworks are going to be able to meet those challenges. Uh, so just as a marathon runner would have to train very hard, uh, I think uh, we are facing uh, the current situation as if you know, we've been training for the last 10 years um, for exactly this kind of eventuality. And what Tobias will also tell us um, is um, how the macroprudential frameworks in, uh, in both emerging and, and advanced economies uh, 
can help us to meet the challenges. And this is some work, of course, that the IMF has done. And also, um, we at the BIS have been um, building our own macrofinancial stability frameworks. So uh, let me turn to Tobias Adrian, who is the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department. Tobias. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, with you here this morning uh, at this important conference. I'm going to talk about the policy responses to the rising macroeconomic challenges. And let me just um, go very quickly over the first uh, opening slides here. Uh, we already saw from previous speakers that inflation is a global phenomenon. Uh, it is um, uh, uh, high in advanced economies and emerging markets, and it was very much unexpected. Um, as a result, central banks are hiking, uh, and that is a, a, a very synchronized hiking and is also covering advanced economies uh, and emerging markets alike. As an intended consequence of tighter monetary policy, financial conditions are tightening, and that is particularly pronounced in emerging markets as seen on the right chart. Now, uh, turning uh, to the theme uh, that Professor Oakeshott was talking about, uh, the US dollar has appreciated sharply and emerging markets are facing a multitude of risks stemming from high external borrowing costs, high inflation, volatile commodity markets, and heightened uncertainty about the outlook. So far, investors have continued to differentiate across emerging markets. While there's a risk of further sovereign defaults uh, that we just heard about in many frontier markets, uh, many of the largest emerging markets seem to be more resilient to the external vulnerabilities and advanced economies uh, broadly are even more resilient. Local currency bond markets have seen large net portfolio outflows from non-resident investors this year, reflecting continued pessimism about the outlook. Downside risks to portfolio flows remain elevated compared to historical norms amid persistent dollar strength market volatility, and heightened uncertainty. Um, and as we heard uh, previously, the global economic outlook has deteriorated materially uh, in recent months. A number of downside risks have already crystallized and more might be to come. There's a risk of a sudden disorderly tightening of financial conditions that may interact with pre-existing vulnerabilities. So while emerging market central banks have made major strides in gaining monetary policy credibility in, past, in the past two decades and have achieved a much higher degree of control over inflation, external shocks still pose a greater challenge for emerging markets than for advanced economies. The pass-through from commodity price shocks and exchange rates to inflation tends to be much higher and more persistent in, an, in emerging markets compared to advanced economies. Some recent IMF staff estimates indicate that a 10% depreciation in emerging market currencies against the dollar causes the price level to rise about 2%, several times larger than what is happening in advanced economies. The bigger rise in inflation means that emerging market central banks must raise interest rates more aggressively to curtail inflationary pressures so that the depreciation may well be uh, contractionary as the stimulus from net exports is more than offset by the fall in domestic demand. Similarly, some other IMF staff estimates shows that the effect of an oil price shock on inflation are much larger in emerging markets than for advanced economies. Inflation expectations in emerging markets also seem to be more sensitive to the fiscal position than in advanced economies which is a concern given the run-up in public debt in the wake of the pandemic. As seen in the right-hand panel, a surprise increase in government debt boosts medium-term expected inflation in emerging markets significantly while having little effect in advanced economies. So the punchline is that 
these uh, responses, endogenous responses to shocks, uh, particularly uh, the responses of inflation in emerging markets are much worse than in advanced economies. So what is the right policy framework? Uh, so what should central banks be doing in this environment uh, with lots of downside risk, lots of inflation, and potentially further adverse developments? In both advanced and emerging market economies, central banks should uh, need to act resolutely to bring inflation back to target. This requires monetary policy to be tightened to ensure that inflation expectations are anchored, credibility is preserved, and unwarranted market volatility is avoided. Communication can play an essential role in reining in on inflation. Central banks should indicate that they will stay the course and maintain tight policy as long as inflation remains high. In this process, other policies can help too. For instance, fiscal policy should support monetary policy, which in some countries may require a change in the fiscal stance. And in some cases, the complexity of policy trade-offs in the context of significant frictions may warrant the use of other policy tools. This is explored in the IMF's Integrated Policy Framework, IPF. The IPF, the Integrated Policy Framework, shows that in the presence of vulnerabilities, using additional tools can help ease trade-offs for certain shocks. Key frictions that characterize many emerging markets could limit the benefits of exchange rate adjustments. Shallow markets can amplify movements and cause excessive exchange rate volatility. Large FX mismatches on balance sheets can cause exchange rate depreciations to have detrimental impacts on the financial health of corporates and households, generating negative co-movements between output and inflation. And weak central bank credibility can result in large exchange rate pass-throughs of inflation. Such FX mismatches and high pass-through worsen the trade of facing policymakers with an easier policy stance providing less of a boost to output and causing inflation to rise more. The integrated policy framework models feature these real world frictions, which matter for policy in reflect volatile capital flows that are a key concern for emerging markets. The work that we have been doing on the integrated policy framework suggests that when frictions are present, uh, such as those I described, foreign exchange intervention or FXI, macroprudential macro policy tools, MPMs, and capital flow measures, CFMs. So FXI, MPM, and CFMs can enhance monetary autonomy, improve financial and price stability, and reduce output volatility. So let me go into more detail. We have a quantitative IPF model, which is an open economy new Keynesian framework with most of the newly added features aimed at increasing the model's ability to capture key characteristics of emerging market data. The model accounts for nominal rigidities in prices and wages and also posits that some agents form inflation expectations adaptively. In addition, Financial markets are assumed to be incomplete. This means that we explicitly account for occasionally binding constraints, such as an effective lower bond on interest rates, as well as domestic borrowing constraints, which can give rise to sudden stops. In the model, large depreciations pose challenges, particularly for emerging markets, as these can trigger a tightening of financial conditions and result in unfavorable policy trade-offs because of weak anchoring of inflation expectations. The quantitative IPF model allows us to easily account for spillovers, though in my presentation today, I will only focus on the limiting small open economy case. First, let me highlight the difference in trade-offs that are faced by advanced economies and emerging markets from the perspective of the model. 
In this slide, we consider a portfolio shock that causes investors to be less willing to hold bonds issued by the home economy. The shock is assumed to generate a real exchange rate depreciation of 10% in an advanced economy shown on the upper left chart. In all panels, blue solid lines correspond to the advanced economy while dotted red lines depict the evolution of vulnerable emerging market economies. As expected, the exchange rate shock doesn't pose a major policy challenge in advanced economies. The depreciation stimulates net exports, which in turn causes output to rise. While higher import prices also cause inflation to rise, the increase is transient, meaning the central bank can look through it and focus on output. As you see, in advanced economies, the shock looks very similar to standard aggregate demand shock. In contrast, the emerging market economy faces a more difficult trade-off as inflation rises substantially and persistently. The central bank hikes policy rates noticeably so that output actually contracts. Despite a similar part of exchange rates and much larger policy increases, both domestic and CPI inflation in the emerging market economy end up significantly higher than in the advanced economy. While we don't show this here, a very large interest rate hike would be required in the emerging market to fully curb inflationary pressures on account of poorly anchored inflation expectations. It is thus unsurprising that emerging market central banks seek additional tools to improve output inflation trade-offs. Now this slide considers how FXI foreign exchange intervention could affect the policy frontier of a vulnerable emerging market affected by a flight to safety scenario reminiscent of the onset of the COVID pandemic. In particular, apart from the portfolio capital outflow shock considered previously, the exercise is driven by negative persistent shocks to productivity and intertemporal preferences occurring domestically and abroad. These make the borrowing constraints bind under standard Taylor rules, the solid blue line, with a case in which authorities additionally sell FXI depicted by the dash red line. The simulation shows that FXI can significantly reduce the depreciation of the exchange rate, allowing monetary policy to be more accommodative on account of more muted inflationary pressures. The upshot is that this policy allays the stagflationary effects of the crisis scenario, reducing inflation while boosting output and exerting even larger expansionary effects on domestic demand, since real net exports improve less. The gains in macroeconomic stability are particularly large if the intervention is strong enough for the economy to prevent a sudden stop, which is the case in this example. In the medium run, however, the stronger exchange rate and domestic demand under FXI translate into less trade balance improvement and consequently a slower accumulation of net foreign assets. This creates an intertemporal trade off for policymakers uh, as preventing a deep recession today comes at some cost of higher vulnerability in the future. Overall, there are some longer run costs associated with FXI the ability to improve near-term inflation output trade-offs uh, makes them less attractive, uh, especially in the case of fairly transient shocks. The appeal is somewhat diminished, however, as the shock becomes more protracted. While FXI is still improving near-term uh, policy trade-offs, they weaken the turnaround of the domestic borrowing that is needed to lower the risk of another stock. Now, having said of that, of course, FXI should be used sparingly. Given the trade-offs associated with the use of FXI, our work on the IPF recommends against the indiscriminate use of FXI. FXI is appropriate only where frictions are identified and only where shocks are large. FXI should not be used to maintain a misaligned exchange rate or to substitute for warranted macroeconomic adjustments. And FXI is no substitute for deep markets, healthy balance sheets, and strong institutions.
Moreover, the benefits of FXI always need to be weighed against the possible negative impacts on central bank credibility and long-term consequences. Central banks should be mindful of their reserves uh, levels uh, and avoid running down reserves, especially as adverse conditions may uh, persist for some time. Beyond FXI, other tools such as macroprudential policies are crucial in mitigating the adverse impact of exchanges of changes in global uh, risk tolerance. Countries should build buffers where possible and set macroprudential policies to safeguard financial stability while considering country specific circumstances and the near term economic challenges, they should tighten selected macroprudential tools uh, as needed to tackle elevated uh, vulnerabilities. Finally, uh, and this is uh, uh, to conclude uh, my uh, remarks today, let me talk about uh, the institutional view, uh, which was recently reviewed by the IMF. Uh, the institutional view has always recognized that capital flow measures, in addition to FX intervention and market potential tools, uh, CFMs, capital flow measures, can also be part of the toolkit to respond to shocks. When faced with outflows, countries can introduce temporary outflow CFMs in imminent crisis circumstances and uh, ease existing inflow CFMs. Such policy actions can be useful to support the needed macroeconomic adjustment for crisis countries without substituting for warranted macroeconomic adjustments. The logic of the usage of CFMs within the IPF model is very similar to the one of FXIs. The revision of the IV, which took place this year, um, introduced important policy changes, especially allowing for preemptive CFM MPMs on inflows, which over time may serve to make countries more resilient to this type of shocks we are currently observing. Uh, let me stop here uh, and turn uh, back uh, to Hyun. Thank you very much, Tobias, for um, giving us that uh, uh, very insightful presentation on how complementary tools um, can really help to improve the trade-offs uh, in monetary policy uh, and, and fiscal policy. I think uh, Tobias's presentation gives us a very good sense of how much the, the analytical thinking has progressed uh, in the international uh, financial institutions. Uh, and that's certainly also the case um, at the BIS, where we have uh, conducted very similar work and have come to very similar conclusions. Now, in this uh, discussion, uh, in the multilateral setting, the OECD is a very important voice. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Winfried Flaschke from the OECD, uh, who will give us um, the perspective from the OECD, in particular from the vantage point of the um, uh, of the code on capital market uh, liberalization of, of the OECD. Winfried. Thank you. Um, indeed, this uh, fits very well with the end of uh, Tobias' uh, presentation um, on the capital flows. Um, I'll take a few minutes um, to look at the, um, at the flows themselves and then uh, get into the uh, policy measures. Uh, and then uh, discuss the, the two <coughs> frameworks uh, of the IMF and, and the OECD. Um, in terms of flows, maybe if we could have a quick look first at the, uh, at the FDI flows, which we um, collect at the OECD. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, with the OECD direct international investment statistics. Um, there you'll see that um, actually FDI flows have been on an upward uh, trajectory. Um, last year, they actually surged by 88% uh, above pre-pandemic levels, uh, driven by high earnings of foreign-owned business uh, not distributed to parents. Um, greenfield investment was also well above uh, pre-COVID levels in advanced economies, but still weak in, in emerging economies. And uh, we saw a further increase in the first quarter of this year uh, of 28%. Um, and you can see there, 
Uh, of course, what we don't have yet is uh, the impact of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We don't know yet what will happen uh, with FDI flows going forward. There's always a lag in the, in the FDI uh, statistics. And then, um, quickly on uh, portfolio flows. Uh, from uh, emerging market economies, we've saw, seen uh, strong outflows. Uh, you'll see that uh, the first thing in March 2020 was related to COVID. And then at the end of the, this chart, you will see the, um, the drop beginning of this year. And this is just uh, the, the first uh, few months. And you will see this was already uh, larger than the drop uh, post-COVID, if you aggregate it. Um, now, if we go to the measures, Um, so at the OECD, we're uh, also monitoring, of course, uh, the measures that uh, countries are taking regarding capital flows, mainly of the OECD members, but not only. Um, we have a specialized group in the OECD that monitors these, the capital flows. Um, and here you can see uh, this chart. I'm not, I don't have time to go through all of it, but you'll see that post-2008, um, there was a substantial liberalization of restrictions on outflows and some reintroduction of inflow restrictions. So this includes, uh, just to clarify, it includes uh, capital flow and macroprudential measures. And then during the COVID crisis, uh, what we have not seen is, uh, or seen very little of, was um, outflow restrictions. Um, so those were almost not used, but what we've seen is a loosening of inflow restrictions. And uh, those now at the, uh, in late 2020 were reversed, so going uh, back to the, the pre-COVID state. Then uh, quickly, um, Looking at the, the uh, at inflow and outflow uh, periods, um, surges and, and policy responses. Um, according to our um, research, the inflow measures are more likely to be reintroduced during or right after a surge episodes uh, than before episodes, uh, which again is a question that came up this morning. If we are, uh, uh, behind the curve or uh, not, it's, it's also the, the question in, um, in uh, capital flow measures, of course, and macroprudential measures. Uh, macroprudential policy appears to be tightened ex post in, in emerging markets. And then uh, on the outflows, um, we haven't seen a clear pattern in the use of outflows of macroprudential tools. Um, but we've seen that um, in easing of inflow controls, in stop and flight episodes has been helpful in, in some cases. Uh, outflow controls are rarely tightened. Uh, it's typically a last resort tool uh, in crises. Okay, now coming to the, the policy frameworks. As you know, the main policy frameworks for capital flows uh, are the OECD's uh, capital movements code and the IMF institutional view that, that uh, Tobias mentioned just now. Um, there's a lot of questions that we get on in, in the G20 and also in our groups to clarify how the two frameworks relate to each other um, and if they are compatible, if they are coherent. So quickly for background, uh, the OECD code, it's one of the founding instruments of the OECD, it dates from 1961. Uh, it's a legally binding framework, a set of mutual rights and obligations on capital flows. Um, it was last revised in 2019, and I'll talk a little bit, uh, if I have some time, about the, the revisions. Um, but the uh, review that we did in 2019 introduced more flexibility for certain measures affecting capital flows. Um, and and uh, just what it, it, there was a whole list of uh, things that were changed there. Um, I will just mention one of them which was the introduction of so-called case-by-case -case assessments uh, 
of restrictions on FX liabilities of financial institutions, which is typically a, a big issue, including has been an issue for Korea, of course. Um, and there, uh, under the revised code now, the um, OECD committee that reviews such measures um, can do a case-by-case -case assessment, taking into account um, all the circumstances of the country's introduction of such measures, which provides a lot of flexibility, um, rather than to follow just the clear legal rules. Of course, you have a kind of a tension there. Some countries, they want clear rules of the road for this. Uh, but in this case, there's, um, it's a very comprehensive assessment. And um, the uh, OECD committee in charge of this has already done several such assessments and in all those cases considered uh, that there were not uh, restrictions and that uh, the country did not, did not need reservations for those. Um, the second uh, framework that of course uh, everyone knows more about probably, uh, the IMF institutional view, which was also just uh, revised, but it's a different type of framework. It's a framework for policy advice. It's not a legally binding uh, agreement. Um, and there again, the, the focus of the review was in many uh, respects very similar. Um, there was a view, um, flexibility introduced on preemptive inflow, uh, CFM MPMs, under certain circumstances, uh, plus a number of uh, uh, other measures was clarified or introduced, plus additional guidance for certain uh, measures. So we've um, actually looked in quite some detail uh, on the differences and on the two reviews. We've just had uh, this Monday uh, in the OECD, uh, the group that looks at this uh, whole day meeting, focusing almost exclusively on, on this issue. Um, and uh, so it seems the two reviews of both frameworks have led to, to additional coherence, so they brought them closer together. There may be a number of issues where we have to do some follow-up work and do additional analysis, both on the fund side and on the OECD side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manfred. Um, so let's change gears now and uh, let's go back to the strong dollar. Uh, that's a very important theme for us. Uh, today and uh, in the recent period. And uh, we're very fortunate to have Professor Charles Engel from the University of Wisconsin, uh, who will talk to us about the, the implications of um, the strong dollar right now and give us some perspective on where we are relative to historical experience. So Charles, over to you. Uh, thanks, Hume. Uh, so let me uh, uh, begin by uh, complimenting uh, Hiranya on uh, his uh, detailed analysis of uh, the problems of fiscal deficit and debts in the low income and, and middle income countries. And I, I wanna compliment uh, his discussion by focusing on a bit on monetary policy in particular on the uh, value of the US dollar, um, which Maury also touched on uh, quite a bit. So, so as you know, the dollar's appreciated sharply since early 2021, and that's true against a broad index uh, and uh, also true uh, for the dollar against advanced economies and, and emerging markets. And because uh, consumer prices adjust slowly, uh, that's reflected in real exchange rates as well. Uh, and it's typical actually of the dollar to appreciate in times of global stress, which is a point I'm gonna come back to in a, in a minute. Uh, but actually the dollar now is appro approaching all time uh, highs. It's nearly to its uh, 1984 value in terms of its real value. So here uh, is a broad dollar uh, uh, index, and uh, this goes back a little bit before 2008, but I'm focusing here on the recent uh, uh, last couple of years where the increase is a, a, a real appreciation of the dollar. But even uh, against emerging markets, you see the same uh, behavior. Uh, this chart goes back a little bit further. It goes back uh, to the mid-1990s, and you can see that uh, already uh, in real terms, the uh, value of the dollar is, is uh, higher than it has been uh, during this entire period. But as I, as I mentioned just a minute ago, it's actually all, uh, approaching uh, the all-time highs, which Maury uh, referred to in the, in the early 1980s. And uh, this is uh, uh, a similar uh, set of graphs for a set of middle-income countries uh, 
somewhat shorter time span, but again, you can see the dollar has appreciated against uh, this set of countries over the last year and a half. That's not true of uh, the dollar against all uh, middle income countries. Uh, the dollar hasn't appreciated against, uh, for example, the oil exporting countries like uh, Mexico and uh, Colombia and Brazil, but it is a, a general phenomenon. And uh, I want to, I just want to, first of all, uh, you know, point to a couple of implications of this. And, and one of the kind of more interesting ones for me is looking at the implications uh, for the prices of uh, food and, and, and oil. So uh, this, this chart here starts by, it's an IMF chart, which uh, emphasizes the importance of food and, uh, and uh, energy prices have been in the recent uh, uh, global inflation. So the, 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 the food prices and, and energy prices uh, feed into the yellow and the two blue uh, parts of the graph. Uh, and so they have had a, a pretty large direct effect on global inflation. But also a recent uh, uh, IMF study has argued that second round effects, in this case of oil price increases, are bigger when inflation is already high. So, you know, if you look not only at the direct effect of oil and food prices on inflation, but also the second round effects in terms of increasing wage uh, demands, uh, the, the effect of uh, uh, these oil and food price uh, increases have been pretty substantial. But here's what I think is kind of neat is that, you know, if you think in terms of uh, the dollar, the, the price of oil has increased about 100% since uh, early uh, 2021. But if you look at other currencies like the euro or the pound or the yen or the Thai baht or the Malaysian ringgit, it's been actually a lot more. It's been uh, as much as a, you know, 163% increase in Japanese yen terms. And, and it's almost paradoxical because it, essentially the law of one price holds for the price of oil but of course, this, uh, this difference is, has to do with the appreciation of the dollar against uh, these uh, currencies. So it's amplified the effect of the uh, increase in the price of oil when expressed in, in terms of their own currencies. Well, what's the implication of that? Well, if you think that oil price increases and, and food price increases are feeding in as a, as a um, cost push shock into inflation, it means that the dollar appreciation uh, has amplified the cost push shock for many other countries uh, outside of the United States uh, throughout the world. So that's one channel through which the dollar appreciation has uh, worsened the inflation output uh, trade-off for other countries, but there are other channels as well. Uh, and, and, and Maury Opsfeld mentioned the price of imports. And I just wanna uh, emphasize that it's not just imports from the US that are priced in dollars as, uh, as uh, Gita Gopinath and her uh, co-authors have emphasized there's a lot of international trade is um, invoiced in dollars even if the trading countries are not the U.S. Uh, so for example trade between Japan and Chile might be uh, uh, denominated in dollars. So this chart the part I've circled here uh, shows that about half of uh, world trade is invoiced in dollars. Now the yellow, that's the blue bar the yellow bar is the euro, which is also substantial, but almost all of that, not almost all, but most, much of that trade, certainly most of it is intra-European trade where the uh, change in the uh, value of the euro wouldn't uh, uh, you know, influence the, tr the uh, relative prices for the trading partners. But, but since much of trade is uh, denominated in dollars, an appreciation feeds through into an appreciation of the dollar feeds through to an increase in uh, prices of imports in terms of uh, local currencies. So, um, so, so here I'm saying, well, the dollar uh, appreciation increases inflationary pressure, which many speakers have already mentioned. But, but I, I want to do this uh, little thought experiment because the, the, the exchange rate is not just some exogenous variable and the dollar appreciation isn't just something that hits uh, countries and, and, and that's uh, something they can't control. So the thought experiment I want to do is suppose that the U.S. and the rest of the world were completely symmetric. The, they were both equally vulnerable to, to these supply shocks, equally vulnerable to COVID. Of course they're not, but let's do that thought experiment for a minute. And suppose that they followed the same monetary policy in response to these shocks. Well, then I would argue that, that maybe the exchange rate wouldn't change at all. So it, in, in, in other words, my point is that the, the value of the dollar depends not only what, on what the U.S. is doing, but also what other countries are doing. So, so 
Okay, so, so my first point here is that part of the reason the dollar has appreciated is that the markets perceive that the uh, Fed is tight, going to be tightening more than many other countries. And, and that, that's perfectly reasonable because the uh, effect of some of these shocks, especially the energy price shocks, have hit uh, other countries more than the U.S. The natural gas in Europe, uh, 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 Japan and Korea are big oil importers, while the U.S. has, has basically got a trade balance in, in energy. So it's natural that they are going to not want to tighten uh, monetary policy as much as the U.S., but in that case, the, 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 the tight monetary policy is feeding back and making the, because of the appreciation of, of the dollars, making the inflation output trade off worse for other countries. But that's not all, because I, actually there's, there's a, an important asymmetry that even if we were in a world where uh, the U.S. and other countries were following the same monetary policy, uh, I would argue that the dollar would appreciate anyway. And that's because I think there's a large um, liquidity effect on the value of the dollar. So you see this during times of uh, uh, global financial stress, like the global financial crisis, or the uh, dash for cash in March uh, 2020, when there was a big increase in demand for liquid dollar assets, and that led to uh, an, uh, an increase in the value of the dollar. Equally, or maybe not equally, but, but also during times of global monetary contraction, dollar liquidity is, is scarce. And so my point here is that even if uh, all countries were following the same monetary policy as the U.S., uh, that we would see an appreciation of the dollar because uh, uh, the, of the contraction of uh, the supply of liquid dollar assets. And so here, uh, this chart is just showing you in 2008, and again, in March 2020, those are the shaded areas, the appreciation of the dollar, which were times of increased demand for dollar liquid assets. Um, and this chart, uh, the, the one on the left, the, the red line which spikes during the global financial crisis is a measure of the liquidity yield on U.S. Treasury assets relative to uh, the liquidity yield of, uh, in, in the other G10 countries. And then the dark blue line is, an ap is, the, is the value of the dollar, where here a decrease means an appreciation of the dollar. And then the scatter point is, uh, of, uh, on the right side is showing you the relationship between this liquidity yield and the value of the dollar. And again, here the point is that it's uh, this, uh, val the value of uh, liquidity, uh, not just the monetary policy per se, that uh, is helping to drive the value of the dollar. So, uh, you know, the upshot, again, is that uh, even if countries were sort of, you know, just, I mean, the U.S. might think, oh, we're so good, we're, we're following this tight monetary policy, and if only countries, other countries would follow us, the dollar wouldn't appreciate. But, but I don't think that's right because uh, the, uh, of the, the uh, contraction of uh, liquidity. And then, and then it's not just the uh, inflation output uh, trade-off that matters, but uh, as Tobias has uh, talked about and Hoon uh, talks about a lot, uh, the appreciation of the dollar uh, affects uh, uh, financial stability. A large portion of uh, internationally held debt is denominated in dollars and, and a dollar appreciation increases the local currency value of that debt. Now that threat's uh, at least partly mitigated by the fact that many central banks hold a lot of uh, uh, dollar reserves and, and the U.S. has extended uh, dollar swap lines. So. Uh, here, the, 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 the leftmost uh, bar chart is showing you the fraction of world uh, reserves in dollars, which is high, but the next line is showing you how much of internationally held debt is denominated in dollars, which is, which is even higher. And actually, this chart, which I don't really have time to explain, um, but, but it's from the BIS, and, and the point of this chart is that uh, there, there's still a problem, even with all these swap lines that, that, that have been extended by the Fed. So the, so the left chart is showing you the, the uh, amount in, in d of funding uh, of private banks uh, throughout the world in dollars. But what the right chart is showing is that um, is the vulnerability of uh, the banking system in many countries in the following sense that uh, uh, countries that uh, 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 whose banks have a lot of funding in dollars, um, mo most of it is uh, offshore, meaning it's, they're, they're not funding, or m much of it anyway, they're not being funded through affiliates uh, in the U.S. where uh, dollar liquidity is more available, but they're being, it, it being funded on their, in their own countries. But 
The striking thing about this chart, and that's the orange line, is that the most vulnerable countries, the ones that have the most uh, dollar funding coming from outside the U.S. are actually in countries that don't have dollar swap lines. Uh, so, you know, I want to conclude by just, <laughs> you know, talking about something more he talked about, which is monetary policy cooperation. But I want to think about it from the U.S. standpoint. Because the U.S. Uh, will, will just say we are not interested in cooperation. I mean, they, they don't say it in that many words, but they do still say it. And they say, well, the U.S., uh, the Fed's uh, objective is uh, mandated to be inflation and employment and not anything international. And to some extent, uh, you know, it's understandable the U.S. is not very open to trade uh, since uh, uh, trade is denominated in dollars, the expenditure switching effect is small. Now, one thing that is uh, uh, important for the U.S. but seems to be ignored is that an appreciation actually does have a significant effect on the wealth of Americans because uh, about uh, the, the, the U.S. holding of foreign assets is about 100 percent of U.S. GDP. So to the extent that those assets are denominated in, uh, in foreign currency, a dollar appreciation uh, has a significant uh, effect on reducing uh, U.S. wealth. But nonetheless, I don't think that the Fed uh, considers that in making monetary policy. They're fully focused on inflation and uh, employment in the U.S. Uh, so um, let, let me just conclude. I, I do have one thing to say about it. But you know, so, so just to recapitulate, uh, the dollar does put this uh, extra inflationary pressure on other countries. Uh, the U.S., the, the economies in the rest of the world are, are already more stressed by the effects of energy price increases. Uh, but uh, the uh, flight to safety effect, this demand for liquidity, worsens the problem by appreciating the dollar. There appears to be this gain from cooperation if the U.S. would only do something about the dollar. I, d I don't think the U.S. is going to orient monetary policy toward affecting the dollar. Of course, as Tobias said, uh, individual countries can do sterilized intervention. The Fed is not going to undertake sterilized intervention to affect uh, the value of the dollar. But uh, let me just leave one thought that I do think that uh, the one thing that the Fed could consider is its uh, balance sheet policy. So they might uh, focus on the policy rate uh, for uh, fighting inflation, but I think the Fed might consider slowing down the contraction of its balance sheet because I think the balance sheet is primarily working through its effect on the supply of uh, liquid dollar assets. And so uh, it, they could provide more liquidity by not contracting the size of the balance sheet so quickly. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, next, it's going to be uh, Dr. Chong John Guchol from uh, the KDI, who will uh, link everything and uh, bring it back to monetary policy and the challenges facing monetary policy right now. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. The main topic I prepare for today's discussion is about high inflation and monetary policy. Dr. Koze shared his valuable insights into high inflation and weak growth, and I too believe that supply shocks are pushing inflation and slowing growth. The stance of monetary policy to curb inflation is adding pressure to economic growth. In this regard, I'm going to start to talking about the ongoing supply shock, inflation, and monetary policy. I like the number three. The rapid rise in these three variables is posing a huge challenge to the global economy. First, this persistently high inflation is signaling a warning reminding us of the oil shocks of the 1970s. Core inflation, excluding highly volatile items, already exceeded the 2% target. In response, most central banks are rapidly raising their policy rates. The dollar is strengthening as the U.S. is bracing for higher and faster rate hikes. Next is about high inflation and monetary policy. As for high exchange rates, please check the discussion by my advisor, Professor Engel. 
Let me account for three factors that have caused the recent inflation and affected the course of monetary policy response. First, supply shock has lasted much longer than expected. The bigger challenge is we have no idea of how long this supply shock is going to last. The direction of monetary policy may differ depending on the persistence of this supply shock. If it ends shortly, the central bank can ignore it. High uncertainty of supply shock persistence make it difficult for policymakers to come up with a proper response. Second, in the pandemic, the Fed was constrained by the zero lower problem, bound problem. It pursued the stability of expected inflation by promising to continually, continuously offer enough liquid supply. In particular, the Fed's introduction of the average inflation targeting can be compared to allowing higher than target inflation in the recovery phase to come. How well do you think this policy measure worked? Prices rose quickly after a temporary fall. This trade-off is now working the other way around. The Fed is trying to stabilize the mid-term inflation expectation and to maintain its credibility by doing so, even facing the economic slowdown. Finally and thirdly, there was a mistake in monetary policy. I'm not here to judge whether the authorities' plans and choice in fight against inflation was right or not. Nevertheless, several indicators were giving signs of rising inflation in early, two early 2021. In particular, core PCE was on the rise from the perspective of average inflation target. The gray line indicates the 2% average in inflation target. I think that at least at that point, the Fed could have initiated a normalization process. Now, record high inflation is expected to continue. But there's not much talk about the current position of the average inflation targeting. If this policy measure is still in part of the Fed's stance, the inflation need to be dropped to a very low level for the time being. The gap between blue line and gray line is very huge. That gap should be shrinked. I'm afraid the Fed will seek extreme policies to keep its promise. It has been argued that this persistently high inflation may continue in the long run. Others argue that there are several negative structural factors in the real economy, and inflation will remain elevated as production costs rise. The real economy has gone through various structures, but the proposition that the central bank can achieve the target inflation by adjusting the money supply has been rarely been challenged. Financial market also still expect the inflation will stand at around 2% five years later. The series in the figure is a measure of expected inflation over the five year period that begins five years from today. If the long-term growth rate falls due to the structural factors in the real economy, the real neutral interest rate will also decrease. Low real interest rates means lower normal interest rates, and the zero lower bound problem may occur more 
frequently. A sufficiently strong forward guidance may be needed to deal with falling inflation in the face of economic downturn, just like the case during the COVID crisis. If not checked properly, inflation will soar again in the future. It means that inflation may become more volatile in the future. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. And uh, I wonder if we can have Ihan Koza and Tobias Adrian on the screen so that we can have a wrap-up discussion. Uh, and while that uh, um, problem is being solved, uh, let me just share a few thoughts on some of the lessons, certainly, that I took away from uh, Professor Opsfeld's presentation this morning and also from the very good um, panel discussions we've had from the panelists. So one lesson that I took away, Ayan and uh, Tobias, was the diversity across different countries. So on the one hand, as Hirania told us, uh, developing economies, low-income economies in particular, are facing very uh, severe challenges from uh, fiscal sustainability and in meeting some of the policy imperatives from uh, the pandemic. On the other hand, uh, Ayan, you also said that uh, some of the large emerging economies are doing better. Uh, partly it's due to the fact that they are commodity exporters and perhaps it's also partly the way that they have conducted their policy um, and in meeting some of the challenges uh, by front-loading their policy hikes. Um, I also saw that uh, in in one of the charts earlier that Brazil had a policy rate of in excess of 12%, um, uh, which uh, um, from a country that has you know, a lot of experience uh, in inflation, I think uh, you know, reflects some of the urgency in, in that preemptive response. So one question uh, that I would have for both uh, you, Ihan, and Tobias is to talk to us about some of the diversity across countries. Uh, so that's one question. The second question is about the dollar because that's a very important theme of our discussion today. <coughs> and as uh, Professor Opsfeld described, um, and he mentioned Korea in particular, if you look at the effective exchange rate of the Korean won, um, that is very much in line with uh, historic of the historical range. If you look at the real effective exchange rate, uh, the one seems quite strong relative to, to its trading partners. And that clearly reflects the, um, the situation in Asia, the, uh, the, the value of the renminbi in China and other trading partners of Korea in Asia as well as in Europe. So, um, so that's um, really putting a very much uh, spotlight on what Charles was talking about, which is the, the impact of the, of the broad dollar index. Um, so that's the second question that I would have for the panelists. Uh, so how should we think about the exchange rate channel? Um, if we look at the effective exchange rate, it seems very much in line with historical evidence. If we look at the bilateral exchange rate relative to the dollar, that seems to be uh, where many of, the f uh, yeah, many of the financial strain seems to be coming through. And the third question that I have for you, and this is uh, engaging the discussion between Winfred and Tobias, is the policy response. So, uh, you know, we have spent the last 10 to 12 years after the global financial crisis in strengthening our macro prudential frameworks. So we have learned our lessons from the 2008 crisis. That was a crisis when the banking sector came under severe strain the banking system is considerably stronger than before, and even during the pandemic shock, we had a very resilient banking sector that could offer a bulwark of support for the financial system. Instead, the vulnerability seemed to be uh, migrating to the non-bank intermediaries, so-called the NBFIs, non-bank financial intermediaries, and that's where uh, we are seeing some of the signs of stress um, together with a stronger dollar. 
So um, the question that I would have in that regard is, how successful has the effort been since the global financial crisis in strengthening our prudential frameworks? Since uh, 2008, we now have Basel III, which Tobias uh, knows very much about, and of course Basel III comes from the BIS, so this is something that's also very familiar to us at the BIS. And uh, it's very appropriate that we're having this conference um, in Korea because in 2010, during Korea's presidency of the G20, uh, there was a very strong effort to put in place uh, the debate on uh, the frameworks for macroprudential uh, resilience. And in a way, uh, Tobias' presentation, I think, is uh, showing the fruit of that initial discussion. So we're seeing the, the outcome of that debate. And I, I think it's a very important uh, um, you know, step in that, uh, in that policy progression. Um, so those are my three questions. So um, firstly, how do we see the diversity across economies? Um, secondly, how should we look at the exchange rate? Is it the effective exchange rate or should it be more the bilateral exchange rate? And which is more important for looking at trade on the one hand versus financial conditions on the other? And thirdly, how ready are we to meet the challenges given the progress that we have made in our prudential frameworks? So let me uh, first of all turn over the microphone to you, Ayan, and then I will uh, ask uh, Tobias next to come in. Ayan. Uh, thank you, Tuyun. Uh, there are three questions here, and I think <laughs> the time is limited. I'm just going to focus on the first question. Uh, the, I hear this question a lot when I interact with financial market participants, actually. Uh, there is this perception out there, uh, there is quite a bit of diversity and some countries uh, are in a better position to be kind of resilient uh, in the face of a, a global shock, uh, which is uh, the kind of the tightening of monetary policies and to some extent uh, fiscal policies worldwide. Uh, and that's true. Uh, when you look at, for example, the forecast, uh, what happened in the first half of this year, uh, we downgraded the forecast of commodity importers uh, more than 85% of them. Uh, in the case of uh, commodity exporters, especially energy importers, uh, uh, more than 60% uh, of them ended up getting uh, forecast upgrades. So uh, depending on the evolution of commodity prices, uh, we might see a uh, growth prospects uh, diverging. Having said that, uh, as we have seen in uh, recent months, uh, even uh, oil exporters will see uh, weaker prospects going forward if we get into this zone of very sharp uh, decline in economic growth because global recessions also come with uh, sharp decline in the prices of uh, oil, uh, as well as, of course, uh, especially metals. And then you have the, the, the uh, natural gas. Uh, there are different forces there, uh, given the conditions in Europe, and the possibility of, of course, oil used to, to produce electricity, if necessary, uh, that could affect the price dynamics. So, uh, depending on the kind of the export composition, and of course, depending on the policy space, whatever available, uh, the, the country conditions will differ. One important issue in the context of emerging market developing economies, um, how their inflation expectations are going to react to the type of increases, uh, persistent increases in inflation, these uh, upside surprises. And that's something we need to pay attention to. Uh, when you look at what happened to uh, the sensitivity of inflation expectations to inflation increases. Over time, advanced economies uh, have seen a significant decline in this sensitivity. In fact, uh, prior to the, kind of the pandemic, our estimation suggested that uh, 
inflation expectations do not respond to changes in inflation uh, in advanced economies. If you look at, you know, uh, five year ahead inflation expectations to uh, changes uh, in inflation uh, over the next six months. Now, uh, when you look at emerging market developing economies, uh, monetary policy frameworks have improved, uh, but still inflation expectations remain sensitive to uh, changes in inflation, especially increases in inflation, especially when these increases are persistent. Uh, the degree of persistence has declined over time, but it is still uh, significant and uh, above uh, zero. What does that mean? Uh, that means that uh, advanced economies might end up actually <laughs> overcoming the, the inflation problem uh, earlier than emerging market and developing economies uh, deliver uh, this better inflation outcome. And uh, this, this uh, global shock might end up having a protracted period of higher inflation in emerging market economies uh, than uh, what we uh, ultimately see in advanced economies. So let, let me stop there. I know the time is limited and you have you asked multiple questions. Uh, thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Ihan. Uh, Tobias, um, why don't you take uh, any of those three questions or all of them, if you wish? Yeah, I was going to give a quick, quick answer to each of these uh, three questions. So on the first question, uh, I fully agree that there continues to be differentiation across countries. Uh, countries that are hit hardest at the moment are the low-income countries. Uh, there's a food crisis. There's debt crisis in many countries. Um, and capital is flowing out. Um, the second hardest hit are commodity importers, emerging markets that are commodity and food importers. Uh, they are uh, generally somewhat stronger than the lower-income countries. Uh, but the, the import prices are, uh, of course, a challenge. Uh, thirdly, are, of course, commodity exporters that have been helped uh, by uh, the rise in prices uh, and then followed uh, by, the, by the advanced economies. Uh, but, of course, there's the risk of disorderly tightening of financial conditions. Uh, what we have seen so far, which is, you know, pretty impressive uh, by historical standards, is that the tightening of financial conditions that has been a consequence of the tightening of monetary policy has been fairly orderly. We haven't seen the kind of dash for cash dynamics uh, that we saw in 2020, uh, but there's of course a heightened risk of disorderly tightening. And if this disorderly tightening were to occur, then uh, it could very well be the case that the differentiation um, uh, disappears and there's a generalized uh, sell-off uh, uh, across countries. That's the answer to my first question. Concerning the second question, um, a depreciation is an important shock absorber for the macroeconomy. And that works very well for advanced economies where um, you know, uh, depreciations are an adjustment process uh, that helps uh, to absorb shocks. But of course, for emerging markets, uh, that is not that easy because there are additional frictions. Uh, so the two frictions I pointed to in particular are financial frictions, foreign constraints, for example, as well as imperfect credibility of monetary policy. And in the presence of those frictions, uh, the um, uh, sharp depreciations have uh, adverse side effects. And this is where capital flow measures or uh, FX interventions uh, can helpfully complement a traditional uh, monetary policy tightening. Thirdly, on prudential policy, I fully agree uh, with Dr. Shin's uh, assessment uh, that uh, the banks are in better shape. I would caveat that to some extent. Uh, in uh, advanced economies, uh, we uh, do see a lot of strength, but in some emerging markets, uh, there is actually uh, 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 some degree of weakness uh, in, in the banks. So in adverse scenarios, uh, we do see quite a bit of capital depletion uh, in, in the emerging markets, um, even though, of course, capital levels are much higher today than 10 years ago. Uh, the second uh, uh, worry, of course, is that uh, 
the higher capital requirements in the banks have driven some of the credit intermediation activity into the non-banks uh, that are not uh, 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 necessarily uh, prudentially regulated, right? They, they are regulated for conduct, uh, for investor protection, but not necessarily for prudential reasons. Uh, and uh, this is uh, where we had a lot of concerns in 2020 in the Dash for Cash episode that was certainly uh, playing out in the non-bank financial sector. So there are further reform efforts that are needed here. Let me stop. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, let me turn to the panelists. Uh, yes, Hiranya. I just wanted to say something. Again, what I'm saying in the, from my experience of dealing with the policymakers on a daily basis from the Asia Pacific region. Now, uh, one particular point I see uh, that is very important now uh, that the policymakers in the countries, I'm talking about countries in the Pacific region, small countries, I'm talking about Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, India, Armenia, Georgia. So they, they are the main priorities are right now to how do we provide uh, food at a reasonable price? How do we g ensure that employment opportunities are there after COVID-19 pandemic? How do we ensure that we do everything without jeopardizing our debt sustainability? Now, as Professor Angel said, that um, whether Fed had taken a um, uh, um, tough monetary policy stance or not, the dollar would have appreciated. But look at a counterfactual scenario that uh, do, can we believe that the life would have been different uh, in those small island countries, small countries without dollar appreciation? So it is in this context, one particular point what Professor Ofsfield has uh, highlighted the last part of his lecture, Professor Angel has point highlighted uh, that do we see um, uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, implications of coordination failure? Or what are the role of the, um, uh, do we have enough coordination from IMF uh, to have, uh, to offer a better world to the developing countries? And uh, those, especially those who are oil importing countries, importing food. So the coordin coordination failure, I think is also another fourth issue or fourth questions after your three important issues. Thank you very much, Hiranya. Um, we could uh, do this all day, uh, but uh, um, Winfred, I, would, I, will, I think you're ready to make a point. Go ahead. Uh, yes, just very quickly um, on, your, on your third question, uh, because you mentioned the Basel rules. And um, on many of those, of course, it's true, it still uh, remains to be seen how effective uh, all of them are. Um, in terms of the, the capital flows framework, we've tried to accommodate those as much as possible. Um, talking about, for example, the, the uh, liquidity ratios, and now under the OECD code, um, it's possible to use even um, FX differentiated liquidity ratios without running into any issues with the code. And uh, the IMF framework has also accommodated uh, these measures, so that should help. And um, yeah, just to, to uh, agree on the NBFIs, a lot of businesses move there and we don't s still know, there are much uh, fewer measures, so we don't know um, if those are effective. And yeah, that's what I want to add. Very good, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, thank you to Ayan and Tobias for, for joining us um, virtually. And uh, thank you to all the other participants. Um, it is, this, this has been a really terrific session. And uh, together with uh, Professor Ofsfeld's lecture, I think we, we learned uh, a, a tremendous amount this morning. Thank you very much to everyone. <laughs>